Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm very happy to have my old friend back, Rob Cook. Rob, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Good to see you, man. Of course, you are a distinguished guest who has been on uh, many times, but you have so much information. You've written a lot of great books with um, Rebeats, your company, but today we're zeroing in on Franks for the Memories, a history of the legendary Chicago drum shop and the story of Maury and Jan Lishan. So um, basically, we're talking about Frank's Drum Shop in Chicago, mm-hmm. which is yeah. a famous, iconic shop. Um, Andy Dwyer, I'll give him a shout out right off the top, in uh, Liverpool, ADC Drums. People have probably heard me mention him on the podcast before. He was really pushing this. He said, you got to talk to Rob about this. This is a great topic. There's a lot, lot to it. Uh, big passion of yours. So why don't we just hop in and... Maybe before we even get to the history, going back to the the you know '30s and 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 earlier, why should people be interested in Frank's Drum Shop? Why is it so special? Pretty much a general question about if you're unaware of your history, you're doing to repeat it. That kind of somewhat sure. somewhat that there's a lot to be learned, and I I think as we talk about drum shops and the the ones that have come and gone, the ones that are coming up now, and and. We have reason to be really optimistic there. We'll talk about that later. There's some great new shops coming up. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, I I think really this one sets the bar. Uh, I'll talk about two or three others. But uh, man, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there were about four shops that really set the bar high for what a drum shop should and could be. And I would have to, if it was a horse race, give a... a the nose's edge to to Franks in in Chicago, uh, and, um, it just uh, and and there's some some cool. I mean, people always like to hear the names being dropped and who was involved, what drummers did what, and so on. And man, they're all involved with these four shops. Uh, there was a professional drum shop in uh, New York, Frankie Bolitos, Franks Drum Shop in Chicago. Moe's in Las Vegas and uh, Pro Drum in, in Hollywood. And I, I can't line up all the dates. I'm not sure when the other three were going, but, but I have a pretty good handle on, on the history of Franks. So I, I think it'll be interesting and, and useful information. Yeah, that's it's because people have to, uh, you know, put themselves in that time period where this isn't like the drum set had been around forever. I mean, it's still really early and, um, it's pretty, I feel like it would be almost, I don't want to say a novelty, but you'd talk to someone who wasn't a drummer and they'd go, oh, a, a drum store, you know, like, mm-hmm. is it that, you know, is there that much that they can sell? And the technology is so hugely different. I mean, I mean, the environment that these people were working in, uh, you have to remember this, what there was no internet. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> there was no Google. Uh, there were mail order stores, but man, you had to do it the old fashioned way. Call sure. them on the phone or write them a letter or go there were your options. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty important. And, and even when I, when I did, uh, Thanks for the Memories, there was, there were no scanners. There was no desktop publishing. There was no internet then. So it was all done with, uh, writing letters to people, calling them on the phone. And, and the printing was done with the tractor feed Epson and yada yada. So things yeah. are our whole life around us has changed so much because of the technology. But it, it's something to keep in your the back of your mind as we're we're talking about these shops and what changes they were going through in the early part of the twentieth century. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So another angle of this is your documenting of this shop, which was really important and a uh, big part of history. This book was released, Frank's for the Memories was released in 1993. So like you said, that's a part of this is the uh, putting all of these things together was much harder. So there's there's a lot of angles. Um, all right, without further ado here, why don't you just take us back to the beginning and how did what mm-hmm. how did Frank's Drum Shop, what's the story with it? Well, uh, it's it's called Frank's and, and it's it's not a mistake that there's no apostrophe in Frank's on the cover of the book. That was one change that when Maury Lachan bought the shop that he made, he took out the apostrophe. He wanted to keep the name uh, Frank's Drum Shop, but uh, the apostrophe he felt uh, designated ownership. So he, it was kind of a tip of the hat to Frank Gall, although it was Maury's Drum Shop. 
call it Frank's Drum Shop, but with that would be the apostrophe. Uh, the, the fact that it was named after was Frank Galt. And Frank Galt, uh, interesting guy, uh, interesting family, musical family. Frank Galt was actually born in 1890, he was born, mm. and born into a very musical family. Uh, not too many years ago, I was contacted by a granddaughter of his who somehow came up with my name and, and wasn't familiar with the book, uh, but she was trying to find out more about her grandfather, uh, Frank Galt. And she sent me a couple of photos I'd never seen before. And one is the Galt family band. And there are eight members and they're, they all appear to be adults or near adult age with a whole variety of instruments. There, there was a flute in there, two or three strings and, and so on. And actually Frank Galt was a trombone player. Hmm. She sent me another picture of. Frank and his three brothers, one was George, I can't remember the other two names, but uh, they had a brass quartet. Uh, well, and they became professional musicians. Uh, George Galt was one of three partners that started the Dixie Music House. And Dixie Music House was a huge music emporium in Chicago that did all sorts of instruments uh they had a percussion department and they did strings and brass and so on and uh incidentally one of the one of the partners was named daryl and it was a brother of clarence daryl of uh, the evolution uh, trial fame hmm. uh but uh george george galt was one of the three partners and uh frank galt his younger brother started working at Dixie Music House at the age of 13 in uh, 1903. And they, he worked there for a number of years and well, actually until it burned down later, but, uh, he was kind of pushed into the percussion department. Like I said, he was a trombone player, but he ended up knowing much more about drums, drumming and percussion than most drummers will in a lifetime. <laughs> uh, some of the pictures I have of him uh, from the later days, I've got one where he's leaving a symbol at Zildjian <laughs> and other pictures of him with uh, Obidus and Armand and so on. So uh, he became the guy. But uh, while working for Dixie Music House, uh, he became familiar with drums and drumming in the drum department. Uh, they had a big fire in let's see 1937 and it, it destroyed the building altogether and it, it left frank without a job and it only took him about a year to realize that he could do, keep on doing what he had been doing at dixie but on his own so he that's when he started frank's drum shop in 1938 uh, one year after the big uh, dixie music house uh, fire so, uh, 1938, uh, uh, I should also start mentioning uh, Maury Lachon because he's going to end up being the owner of, the, of Frank's Drum Shop, but he was a good customer at Frank's uh, from the earliest days. Uh, we won't go all the way back to uh, Maury's childhood and so on. That's all in the book. We've got some good pictures of, of Maury and his dad and so on. And Maury was also born into a very musical family. I, I don't know much about the, the formal musical instruction that either Frank Galt or Maury Lachon had, but, but certainly by the time he was uh, in his early teens, Maury was pretty much playing the part of a professional drummer. Uh, as a young man, he had a, a little combo that played the family gatherings and at church and so on. But by the time he was a teenager, that had grown into, you know, gigging at clubs and mm. so on. And, and actually by, uh, the, the mid thirties, uh, he was pretty well established. He had an older brother, Henry Lachon, who was even a light year or two ahead of Maury in a musical career. And he had a, a, a big band, a big society band, one of these cool. things where uh you know 20 30 members in their own tuxedos and playing the, the society gigs and the the, the big uh, clubs nightclubs and so on so uh, uh maureen 
uh, had his wits about him in terms of the, the musical landscape. But uh, so he was he was a good customer of, of Frank Galtz and uh, uh, developed a love for Frank and the shop. And one of the themes that, that I'm going to probably keep coming back to is the strength of a personality on the business that they they run. Yeah. And, and, I, and it's pretty obvious when they don't match up and you get a guy that's got maybe some business acumen, but doesn't really like people and mm -hmm. figures it's a it's a way to make a buck and it just doesn't work out. Yeah. But Frank Galt and Maury Lashan uh were devoted to drummers and drumming. And uh and was and the stories just keep coming through the decades. Uh and one one that comes to mind that, that typifies uh Frank and the way he treated people. When when I went down to uh interview Maury about uh, helping him out with the book. He, he told me this story about when he was uh, playing in big bands and was a customer at, at Frank's. And he went in there and and gone through the symbols and, and he said, you know how a symbol sometimes just sounds right and turns on the lights and it, and boom, it, it, it's there. That's that's your symbol and it talks to you. <laughs> And, and I knew exactly what he was talking about. I haven't had that magical moment that often, but I know yeah, what he meant. It's rare. I mean, uh, symbols are so different, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and there's so many different things you can do with them, and so on. But I, I knew what he meant. He said he was going through, and this one symbol, just I think it was an 18, it just lit up for him, and he's mm. just I gotta have this. He knew what it could do for him, and what he, he could do with it. So he. He tried to stash it uh, at the back of the pile, and the symbols at Frank's, even in those days, were displayed the same way they were decades later when I met Maury at Frank's, and that's on edge, kind of leaning up against each other. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of paw through them, and when you saw something you wanted to give a listen to, you pull it out. Mm. Ding. Well, Not like a tree where we have now, where they're no, all coming no, off. Yeah, no, they were just on edge and leaning, leaning sure. there. So uh, Frank saw Maury hiding this one at the back of the stack and trying to tuck it down behind the other symbols. And he, he asked him what was going on. And Maury explained, this, this is going to be my symbol someday. And I don't want somebody to get to it before I do. So I'm, I'm putting it back here. And, and Frank insisted uh, that he take the symbol. And Maury said he couldn't pay for it. He said, well, we'll work something out. Mm. And at, at one time, he had accounts receivable of, it was in the tens of thousands of dollars. And he, you couldn't just walk in off the street and say, I'd like to charge this. You know, it was, it was all personal favors Jeez. for people. Yeah. And relationships and so on. And, and Maury never forgot that. And, and I've heard similar stories one, you know, decades later. One that comes to mind is Eldo Maza. Uh, he, uh, was at Frank's drum shop, and Maury insisted that he take a marimba with him that he couldn't afford to buy. That's expensive. He, he, uh, <laughs> he paid him back over time, but but uh, that was just the way they did business. You know, they they yeah. trusted each other. They wanted to help each other, and so on. It just makes me think too of of nowadays. I feel like there there is a big. Um, there's a big sense of community that people really like with drum shops of like, we're all in the community together. And I think you and I both love it. And, and most drummers do of like, you know, it's we're, we're all in this together. We are brothers and sisters in drumming. And it sounds like that's the same thing back then where it's this community. And I'm looking at pictures in the book throughout, you know, the thirties and forties. And like I said earlier, there's parties. I mean, these guys are all having, you know, a great time. There's there huge smiles on their faces the parties though, the tables are completely full of like booze bottles, which probably helps with all the smiles and stuff. So it's obvious that they would yeah. enjoy being with each other. Um, and, and that same sense of community that we have now was, was definitely a thing then. Yeah. Yeah. And the shops were a hangout, uh, particularly, uh, I, I know I'm jumping back and forth in decades, but again, I get this image of the four big shops and those were shops that if, uh, buddy or Jane or somebody was going through town and they needed something, they weren't going to send the tour manager or a gopher or something. 
because it was a hang. They wanted mm-hmm. to go and see their old friends and back to the same kind of hang as, as like the drum shows of today where sure. if somebody's not going to get impatient with you if you're asking about a certain thread size or, <laughs> or, or a, a funny ring in, or a buzz or something somewhere on your kit. You know, yeah. they're not, they're not going to roll their eyes and walk away. They're actually interested in, in that. Yeah, what totally. The problem is that's related to percussion. Yeah. So going forward, eventually, uh, Frank uh, retired and he negotiated. He, Maury knew that uh, Frank was going out and uh, Maury was ready to move out of uh, the performing and the recording end of things and, and thought, you know, Frank's drum shop would, would be a, a golden opportunity. And they came close. He had two partners he was negotiating with Frank with and they, they all arrived to sign the papers and Frank was kind of concerned and he sat down with the three of them and sa- said he wanted to make it clear that when they signed this contract with the three of them, that these other two partners were accepting responsibility for Maury and vice versa. Hmm. And the two guys got cold feet. And Maury said Jeez. that was like a red flag going up when they, they looked like they didn't quite get it. And the whole deal fell apart right then. But the next day, Frank called Maury and said, come on in, I want to talk to you. And and worked out what had to be worked out for Maury to buy it. It was a time payment thing. And uh, I think it had to be 10000 down. And Maury only had 2500 that he could really afford. And he borrowed the other seventy five mm-hmm. from his family, uh, his musician brothers and stuff. Um, so it was important for Frank Galt that Maury buy Frank's drum shop. So he did. In uh, it was a little over twenty years. It was nineteen fifty nine when Maury uh, bought Frank's drum shop. Which that's that's and a long Frank time. Stayed, I mean, that's a very that twenty yeah, years for yeah. a drum shop is like yeah. an eternity, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Frank stayed in the picture. He's in a lot of. Uh, uh, later images uh, from uh, of, of Frank's. In fact, the, on the back cover of the book, there's kind of a collage of pictures, and one of them is opening day at Frank's in 1938. And years later, on the 30th anniversary of uh, Frank's in 1968, tried to do a reproduction of that. They had a lot of the same people were there, mm-hmm. and and Frank was in that picture, I believe. They tried to all align in the same places that they were in that opening day picture. So, uh, 1959 is when uh, Maury first uh, became involved. It would be another year before they began the uh, the clinic program. They actually began having clinics there. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of impromptu clinics over the years. Uh, like I say, all these these people that that stopped in when they were in town uh, either get something repaired or just hang out or whatever and quite often would start playing and if it was uh, a gene or buddy almost invariably it was it was weird the way the news traveled and all of a sudden there'd be 30 40 50 people there mm. <laughs> there and one of one of Jan Lashan's favorite stories, was uh, that that happened with uh, Buddy one time? Uh, they set up a kit and he was he was playing and and the next thing you know he, he was really playing and and Jan could see that he was soaking through his shirt and getting drenched with sweat and everything and she had uh, one of the the staff of Frank's run out to a um, um, clothier nearby that I, they had an account with and he comes back with with four shirts uh, for for Buddy. And and he gets done with his little uh, gig there, impromptu gig. And he's telling himself off uh, back in the office. And uh, uh, the guy comes in with the shirts and Buddy says, what's this? And Jan said, well, I could see you were gonna need a, need a shirt. And he said, well, I only can wear one shirt. I only need one. Here, give me the top one. And, 
and don't you touch the other ones. He told me, <laughs> send, send them back. But, uh, it's like so, classic buddy. It's like even a nice act. It's kind of like just accept it, buddy. And just, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, that's really nice though. That's the community though of like, I feel like you can't like plan for it to be the hot spot for the top drummers to go. It has to kind of be naturally, you know, has to happen over a long time and you have to build the reputation and um i mean really for gene and buddy and these guys to come and hang there is, that's pretty cool that's that has to then add to the allure of the shop and make yeah. like everyday people yeah. want to come and buy symbols and sticks and exactly stuff. it was a fun place to to hang out uh, i was from michigan and uh didn't get down there that often so whenever i i was in town uh, i just wanted to go up and and just kind of be there because you know i'd be there for 10 or 15 minutes and i remember one time the phone rang and somebody covered it up said, anybody know anything about mel torme's snare drum and <laughs> somebody else yells out yeah he can't play it <laughs> everybody breaks up laughing <laughs> there was just always something awesome. happening whether it was gear or people or, <laughs> or whatever man but, so uh, cool when when i first found out about it it was actually about 1966 and a very similar experience to you to what you'll hear from a lot of people about when you first go in there because i grew up in retail in my parents office supply store and we were in chicago for a convention and i had a leather drum kit on order from a furniture store in the little town i was from in alma and it had already been six months, and this is '66. So I remember Ludwig's going, you know, three shifts and oh, yeah. selling all the drums they can make, and they were way behind. So, and I was, you know, bargaining the furniture store every week. Where are my drums? You know, and <laughs> and so we're walking down the street in Chicago on this uh, uh, office supply convention junket, and my dad says, uh, uh, "Rob." Yeah, come check this out. And we were walking by this, this uh, it wasn't even a storefront, just kind of an opening. And they had one of these little registers with the, the little movable white letters on a black background with glass over it, like you see in doc, you know, old doctor's offices and so on. And it said Frank's Drum Shop, you know, fourth floor. And my, my dad, knowing how into drums I was and everything, and he'd been putting up with uh, an awful lot at home. Of course, as I practiced in the basement, I'm my old uh, beat-up used kit. I yep. couldn't wait to get my hands on my new Ludwig. <laughs> he said, come on, let's go up and check it out. And I, I wasn't too excited. I thought it, if it's a music store, they're going to have a big display here, and it's going to be on the street. And... You know, it's going to look like a music store. Yep. I don't want to go down that long hallway and get onto an elevator and go go up to Frank's drum shop and have it be a dusty old office. And, yeah. You know, it, my dad insisted. He pretty much dragged me down the hall. Come on, wow. let's check it out. We go down this long hall and get on the elevator and we tell the guy four, go up. Yeah, it, there was always an attendant in the elevator. And generally, if he wasn't parked on the, the street level, he was parked at Frank's because that's where the action was. Yeah. And <laughs> he cool was spot. just always there with the door open, that's sitting funny. there on his stool in the elevator, waiting, waiting yep. for somebody. So uh, you get up to four and the elevator door opens and it's a drum wonderland. <laughs> I mean, all you see, I mean, 18 foot ceilings and sets are stacked to the, to the ceiling. Uh, Phil Stanger told me once that Maury painted when they first moved into the fourth floor. They had originally started on five. When they moved to four, he painted all the walls pink. And it was because he hated pink and he didn't want to see pink. And people knew they were supposed to have stuff stacked up to where you couldn't see the walls. Wow, to keep stocked <laughs> and, and keep uh, the inventory. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If there was uh, uh, six inches of pink above the stack of drum heads, you know, somebody wasn't doing their job <laughs> and they needed to get more stuff from the, the storeroom and oh, stuff. Oh, man. But, and, and, and Maury always talked about the kid who, when the elevator door opened, the 10 year old kid, he swallowed his gum and started choking. <laughs> because 
it, it would do that. They were just, I mean, there were literally hundreds of kids and, and, and all these drunks. Oh. Well, they did a lot of rentals for movies, not only backline and so on, but, uh, so they had these big towels type drums and sure. African drums and, then you get in the back where the sound effects were and they had chimes and, and everything, but you could just stand there and look around for the longest time and entertain yourself. If you were, oh, I'm sure. If you were a drummer. I'm, yeah. And you, yeah. you bring up a great point though, of like, and like very, very early on in the, uh, in your book, I was kind of scrolling through looking for it. It's right. It's the first image is the front of it, at least before I believe in the sixties, this is what it was. There's no markings. I mean, it's like, uh, you would right. walk by this Just every day. Sign. Those little yeah. letters. The little yeah. letters, exactly like a doctor <laughs> or an office building, where they, you know, you stick the letters on. How on earth would you know? I mean, it's a destination business where you kind of have oh, to yeah. know it's yeah. there. I mean, mm-hmm. beyond that, you're not going to like stumble into the fourth floor of a building in the back. I mean, that's to the, the fact yeah. that they were so yeah. successful. Yeah. Is even more not unless you knew something was going on up there and you knew what you were doing, because I, I certainly didn't want to go up there. The, yeah. the neat thing for me, being in the right place at the right time, was being with my dad there because he was more of a people person. And it, being when we walked in, I was I was pretty shy kid, but uh, in short order, my dad knew Maury, introduced himself, and brought Maury over and introduced him to me. And this was the guy that owned this shop. I was. <laughs> I was just blown <laughs> over with, and and he was really nice. He took took me under his wing and took me back and showed me all the teaching studios at that time. But uh, as we went down the hall from the retail area back to the the uh, uh, rentals and Clarence's workshop, there were a bunch of teaching studios, and the names on the doors were like uh, Roy Knapp. Bobby Christian, Bob Tillis, Phil Stanger, and uh, Jim Ross Sr. And a, a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with those names, but but every single one of them was was already an icon in the percussion community. Sure. Sometime we'll do uh, something on uh, Roy Knapp. I don't think we have time to get too deep into the, the Roy Knapp uh, story. Yeah, we've talked about him a little bit about his teaching school and stuff like that. Um, so another another episode, but that's an impressive lineup right there. Yeah, it, it was uh, just incredible. And uh, so those were the instructors that were going on uh, at, at Frank's Drum Shop. Um, mentioned a little bit about the rentals and so on, but Obviously, when it when it came to backline in Chicago, if it had to do with percussion, they were supplying you know timpani to the symphony and uh, making runs to all the biggest clubs and hotels and and so on, delivering stuff. Uh, there, there was a fellow that worked at Frank's for a long time named Paul Jackie, and I don't remember. Who did the interview with him? But it shouldn't take too much googling to find. But uh, he talks about working at Frank's, and uh, he had some interesting stories that I hadn't heard. Even uh, talking with Bill Moore and Jan about uh, Frank's, and uh, one of them was that uh, there was always a beat cop on the street uh, in in the, the the block of Wabash that Frank's was on. And that beat cop kind of watched out for loading and unloading uh, on behalf of Franks. Because they were, on, again, on the fourth floor, on a busy street, Wabash, in Chicago. And what do you do when you get a call and you've got to have a four-piece kit over on Rush Street at some nightclub in 20 minutes? Or Jeez. you've got to have a pair of timpani over to Symphonic, Symphony Hall in yeah. 30 minutes or something. Well, the beat cops always gave preference to uh, Paul, and he had no problem double parking. He always had the stuff ready. It was in the elevator, ready to go. It wasn't going to be like a 20-minute thing, but it was ready to load. He went and got his car. He double parked, no worries with the cop, and load up, and he's off. So it was uh, uh, kind of Paul Jackie's job uh, to 
at Christmas time, uh, deliver a bunch of envelopes and bottles uh, for Maury. And and there were there were envelopes going to the beat cops and oh. to doormen at hotels and man, uh, you know, all, all the the people you really needed to depend on to to do that kind of job and get <laughs> get things where they needed to be. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I mean, this is like I mean, we're talking Chicago in the 30s and 40s. We're paying off cops. So we can yeah. load out our drums. We're working with the different symphonies, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich are hanging out. I mean, it's really the hot spot. And and I guess yeah. also I'm I'm just thinking too that you gotta, you know, like you said, there's the four shops. Geographically, I mean, so you have New York, Chicago, you said Las Vegas, yeah. and then yeah. California and Hollywood. Yeah. I mean, this is really the Midwest spot. Um, I guess because you know, as bands are going through, it's, it's kind of centrally located. So it's, it's, it's not, and there's no internet. So it is more of an event to go. And these guys, it's mm -hmm. a cool spot. And, and, um, it's just neat, you know, and yeah. I love this. <laughs> I love their well, kind of bad another, boy. <laughs> another, <laughs> another allusion to the, the bad boy. One of the stories, uh, in the Frank's book that comes to mind is, uh, in Maury's playing days, uh, he went through a couple of different eras in the, in the, uh, mid 30s to uh, late 30s he was doing mainly uh big gigs uh the the nightclubs the the follies that kind of thing in fact that's where he met his wife jan she was a dancer uh and uh, her the pictures of her in the book are, are amazing she was a really good looking uh, uh hooper doing these big production numbers those would be perfectly kind of things where all the girls have rifles or tennis rackets or something and it's all choreographed when uh uh maury was drafted and he played in that in the service and in the, i believe it was in the army band but when he came out of the service then he got more into the recording and the things he got a, a gig at wbbm uh doing the morning show hmm. uh, which was all live at the time so you know reading charts for whoever came in and and uh uh, right. doing much more of the, the recording rather than the, the live stuff. But while he was still doing the the uh, nightclub thing, uh, a neat story is there was a, a mobster named Nick Dean. And the fun thing with the internet now is uh, when I revisit some of these stories, this stuff all pops up in a heartbeat, where back in the day to research this kind of stuff, you, you were kind of bound to newspapers and, sure. and that kind of thing but anyhow this nick dean owned the colony club and maury was playing there and uh he skipped out to fill in for a drummer for part of a set at another club uh the michael todd and while he was there the owner of the the club he was actually supposed to be playing at the colony club nick dean was dancing and and kept looking at Maury, and and then there was a recognition. He was obviously hurt, and Maury thought, "Uh oh!" And so so the end of the set, he books it back to the Colony Club, and uh, one of his bandmates said, uh, "Hey, hey, where were you? Nick's looking for you." <laughs> and he said, "Well, I yeah, I know he's looking for me. I saw him." He said, "Well, I think you better book and not come in until we're ready." For the downbeat so he made himself scarce and and came in and uh <laughs> nothing happened he didn't he didn't get roughed up or anything Jeez. but it's kind of a an end end to the story maury said it wasn't six months later that nick dean killed his girlfriend oh man and it, was, it was kind of a famous murder her name was estelle carey and uh she uh, was killed in a, a suspicious house fire and, and so on. And if and if anybody even today Google's Estelle Carey or Nick Dean, those stories pop right up. So it was man, he was kind of a notorious guy. So you had to kind of yeah. be careful who you pissed off, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're like, but you know, I mean, you wouldn't know that walking in there that this is sort of a uh, you know, there's some stuff right. going on. Like you wouldn't want to step on the wrong guy's shoes or something. Uh, cause who knows what would happen, yeah. but, um, that's kind of, I mean, us musicians, we, we sometimes <laughs> like that element of danger, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it kind of adds to the, to the cool level yeah. of the drum shop for having like mobsters and stuff mm -hmm. hanging around. 
another story from uh, uh, Maury's playing days that I, I wanted to uh, cover. He was playing with a, a band leader named Jack Riddell, R-A-E-L. And at one point, Jack came to him and said, oh, come over, I've got something you have to listen to. And he had a, an audio clip. And he said, I'm, I'm uh, giving up my playing career, my performing career, and I'm, I'm going to make this girl a star. I mm -hmm. found her in Oklahoma, and she's a little overweight. She's got to lose about 20 pounds. Her name was uh, Clara Ann Fowler. And he said, I need Jan to teach her some makeup tricks. So she comes to Chicago. She she did lose the weight. Uh, Jan LaShawn, Maury's wife, did help her with her makeup and showed her how to apply it and so on. And And they changed her name. And her name, her stage name was Patty Page. Well, uh, Patty Page uh, became a huge star uh, that goes back to those early days, uh, getting started with uh, kind of with Maury and Jan. Uh, Maury played on some of her early recordings. Uh, one, one that's really remarkable is uh, it was one of the first multi-track commercial recordings where Patty Page did a song called I My Eyes Wide Open. Um, and there, she sang all four parts, oh, which cool. in 1954 was was kind of unusual. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, you know, Les Paul, Les Paul had, had uh, sure. been, you know, doodling with multi-tracking since the 30s and so yeah. on. But, you know, it, it's pretty famous that it's a widely known among people that are at all into recording that real multi-track recording didn't even really get started until the Beatles were pretty well along. Yeah. It was a while before they were even doing four tracks. Stuff. Like Les Paul did but, multiple uh, record players being printed to, and then like, like how high the moon and stuff and doing his guitars. Yeah. It, it was a different type yeah. of like, yeah. different process. Well, uh, Panasonic in the mid fifties there in Chicago, came out with a way to record six tracks on a quarter inch tape. Mm. And and they did this uh, recording of Patty Page with her singing all four parts of the harmony. Cool. But, um, Maury was really proud of that and having participated in some of those early multi-track recordings, some of the first commercially uh, done recordings uh, yeah. done by Panasonic in, in Chicago. Well. I mean, um, he seems like a, uh, I mean, I don't want to say an unsung hero, but he seems like one of, one of, there's a, there's a hand, there's, there's a lot of them, but there's people who were at the right place at the right time when the, when the world was changing, you know, getting the drum shop mm -hmm. going, or I guess buying the drum shop from Frank Galt, but like really making it a cool spot because now drum, I mean, drum shops have gone up and down in popularity, but this was a really popular time recording performing drums or drummers or movie stars with gene krupa and you got buddy rich kind of everyone he's a household name so really the right place in the right time yeah yeah and uh another uh area that they really excelled in uh was uh, largely due to thanks to jan jan of course uh worked in the shop with maury from the earliest days uh she retired from dancing when they got married and they started a family. They had uh, two boys and a girl. Chuck LaShawn was more of a song and dance man. He grew up and uh, didn't really take part in the, the shop that much. He worked there a little bit, but he was more into uh, um, singing and dancing, uh, stage productions and so on. Their son, Marty, and did end up uh, running the shop uh, when, when Maury uh, retired. But anyhow, when, when Jan started at the shop, she kind of gravitated to print music, and she almost single-handedly built a world-renowned print music department. Um, almost every piece of print music that came out that was uh, involved percussion, she would get at least a copy of, and if it sold, she'd get two copies and, and, and build it up. Cool. But, but there were literally thousands of pieces of music in her print library and they became renowned as the source for for scores uh particularly for percussion um and along the way uh that kind of 
strikes a chord in my memory with Progressive Arts Society. The, the early founders of PAS, this, this is where it was happening. They were having meetings at Frank's Drum Shop after hours and kind of getting PAS set up. Oh, wow. Uh, so the, the founders were there, Bobby Christian, uh, so many of the people that frequented the shop and, and helped the shop out in those early days, like Roy Knapp, Bobby Christian, uh, Ludwig Sr., and so on. So many of those guys were not only active in PAS, but have since become Hall of Fame members at, sure. at, at the Progressive Arts Society. But um, between not just supplying the, the goods, the actual merchandise, but doing all the rentals and service and repairs and, and so on, but then the print music department, it, it really made it a full service uh, percussion center yeah that, that sets the bar really high at, absolutely at drum shops yeah well, let me ask you this, though, because we're in, uh, I mean, so it's basically 1937 through 1984, which we haven't really gotten that far. Obviously, we haven't gotten that far yet. But so in the, you know, the kind of heyday of Ludwig and Slingerland, was there competition for like, you know, now you think of like a grocery store and it's like, you know, the hardest thing is to get your product on a shelf in a good spot where people can see it. Was there similar, you know... Uh, battles for who gets their drums in Franks because I'm and I'm naming those two because they're obviously Chicago yeah. companies. Would they be like competing, and would there be some envelopes going back and forth that way? You think to kind of get more floor space or I, any, anything like that? I don't, I don't think so. But um, there, there were some personalities and clashes and and so on on the horizon. Um, and, and as far as brands, uh, I think Maury was, was strongest in, uh, he carried everything. I mean, you could go up there. I remember seeing tricks on kids up there and Hollywood wow. Niazze when they had the tronic drums and every, everything you could think of, you saw there at one time or another, but he was really heaviest in, uh, Ludwig and Slingerland. And Rogers probably a distant third wasn't that much of a Gretsch guy. Uh, they they did have some Gretsch stuff there, but um, uh, when when Maury bought the store in '59, uh, one of his first hires was a guy named Bill Crowd, and uh, I won't get into too much finger pointing and he said he said, but there there were some a couple different versions of, of what happened with Bill Crowden and Frank's drum shop. And uh, the way Bill Crowden explained it to me, he had an agreement with uh, Maury from the start that if he stayed with him for five years, he would have an option of buying up to 25% of the shop, buying mm -hmm. in and becoming a part owner. Because if he was going to put his all into it, he wanted some kind of potential payoff. Um, I never asked Maury about that directly, but um, at any rate, by the time the five years were, were coming to a close and Bill started hinting about it to Maury, it was clear that it wasn't going to happen. Uh, so whether it was a misunderstanding, uh, I, I can't say, but uh, Bill Crowden did split off and start his own competitive shop two doors down oh my God. Uh, also also up I, th I can't remember what floor he was on <laughs> but as it turned out it was uh it was on wabash just two doors down and uh he became a huge wretch dealer that was his main he, he carried some other lines and so on okay but gretch at that time actually had a distribution office and sales office in chicago and it their their warehouse was like two floors below Crowden's. So Crowden, Crowden's could sell a kit, virtually anything that Gretsch made, and they were warehousing it all there. He could take his customer down there, give him the boxes, and the guy was on the street with, with his kit. <laughs> so, so Crazy. Wow. Uh, uh, and then uh, Bill Crowden, to add insult to injury, in terms of Maury LaShawn and Frank's drum shop, he married Brooke Crowd or Brooke Ludwig, I'm sorry, 
uh, uh, the chief's daughter. So that didn't go over real well with Maury to have his competitor <laughs> marrying into the Ludwig family. Yeah, related it, now. It's, it's going to kind of grind against him. And it's not like he dumped Ludwig or anything. But from that point forward, there were little wars between Maury and the chief. Uh, mm. And uh, I, I won't get into the more graphic ones and everything, but there was a lot of name calling and, and there was some pretty bitter competition between. It was probably good for the drummers in general. You could go to both shops and uh, they're knocking each other out with yeah. uh, trying to give you the best deal and everything. Yeah, uh, yeah but, but man, two, uh, two doors down is just like not really good for anyone. I mean, yeah. for like, like that's too close. <laughs> One other thing to touch on real quick was the repairs. I don't want to give it short shrift. It was really important. Um, banks always ordered kits in from all of those companies without hardware. And it's, it's no secret that a lot of Dynasonic or a lot of uh, Swivelmatic hardware got put on other brands. And it was so common in the day that uh, Maury was ordering Slingerland and Ludwig kits and Gretsch kits without the hardware attached. They would still get the Tom holder, but it'd be in a bag, you know. And and Clarence, who for decades was the go-to guy in the repair department at, mm. at Franks, would you know you'd pick out your kit and you you either choose the standard mount that came with it, which meant Clarence would drill for that, or if you had a specific desire there, the swivelmatic or whatever, parents could fix it up with that and you'd, you'd leave. But but other other custom things, you know, uh, changing the height of stands and so on. One, one of his first uh, custom instruments, that, that is Clarence, was for Roy Knapp to play chimes. He had uh, a chime mallet uh, kind of tied to a boom handle. But uh, Clarence made him a, a six foot long chime mallet so he could hit the cues yeah. uh, without having to get up out of his seat and so on. So they, cool. they were renowned for being able to do the special custom stuff to accommodate any, any drummer. Man, could you order nowadays drums from these major manufacturers without hardware? I don't even think that's physically possible anymore. They'd probably say, what are you talking about? It'd probably be tough because in those days they were assembling them and drilling each one and yeah. so on. But today they have these spider drills that are drilling all the holes at once. And it, it, it'd be a special order these days to say, leave off the time holder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. It might take you months to get it done depending on the company. Yeah. Jeez. That's cool though. That is a very, you're right. Very interesting yeah. element to it of repairs. It sounds like it's like world-class repairs lessons hangout spot uh shop in general with great inventory and just customer service and from again the pictures it looks like it's just a, a the spot to hang out and that and they would have parties and things like that i mean it's just it's it's yeah, that an annual, there, was, there was a bar on at street level underneath but um they didn't really have room for that kind of socializing in the shop but they had an annual drummers get together down at, mm. the, at the pub on the ground floor and yeah, cool. that, that became a, a pretty <clears throat> famous hang yeah well all right so like i mentioned before i think we've talked a lot about the like you know the black and white era of like franks where you know a lot of like and i'm referring to pictures obviously of like you know it's 30s 40s 50s into the 60s but like so it went to 1984 as we get kind of closer to the end here. What what happened um, with the shop as we get into yeah. more, it, I don't want to say modern, but you know what I mean, yeah. like the 70s yeah. and 80s was different. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, 74, Maury started running into health issues. He had a triple bypass and could see that, you know, he needed to kind of start planning ahead for uh, retirement. And uh, he sold the Frank's drum shop to his son, Marty, in 1978. Actually, in about 1978, they would have been having their 40-year reunion. 
And um, I had started at that point, I graduated from high school in 69, so that was three years after I bought my drums at, at Frank's. But I stayed in touch with him, and he, it, it blew me away because I was a junior high kid in Allen, Michigan, a town of 10,000, and I could call Frank's drum shop and ask for Maury, and he would take my call <laughs> and actually be glad to hear from me. He'd say, how's the weather in Michigan? That's but, awesome. Uh, and I was just bowled over. And uh, they were selling stuff at generally about 40% off. And I, I found that, man, I could, I could sell stuff to my classmates and friends for like 20% off and make it bucks. So, wow. so through high school, I was ordering drums and cymbals and stuff and selling them to my friends. And, uh, but then I went off to college and and then started in business in 72. And all, throughout that time, I'd always visit Frank's whenever I could, and I'd stay in touch with, with uh, Maury. And they, uh, he had actually already sold the shop to his son, and uh, I think he'd already retired to Florida when they had their uh, 40th anniversary. Uh, I went down for that and took a bunch of pictures, and I had begun writing for Modern Drummer Magazine in the first year or two they were out. I had a column called Shop Hopping, where I do reviews of drum shops. So I, I did a special article on Frank's Drum Shop for uh, Modern Drummer, which it was in the January, February 1979, Modern Drummer. And they had a clinic with Alex, Alex Acuna and Don Elias, and it, it was a, a pretty big deal. But I, uh, the reason I bring it up is I worked quite a bit with Marty and with Maury on the background of the shop uh, for that uh, magazine article. Gotcha. And they had, uh, Frank Galt had never really formalized a history of his days, but he did at one point do a handwritten history of of uh, Frank's Drum Shop and uh, Frank's Drum Shop letterhead, actually. So I used uh, quite a bit of that for that uh, article. So I had stayed in touch with with uh, Maury, and when uh, uh, Maury was in Florida, he, he actually uh, started a retirement band called The Second Time Around in his retirement. And they, he got a bunch of these retirees in Florida, people who used to be in big bands and so on. That's and they awesome. started they started a big band of retirees called Second Time Around, uh, which cool. was a really good band. Huh. I still got some cassettes somewhere of, of that. But um, Banks just didn't continue to bloom under Marty like it had under Maury. And there's a lot of things you could point fingers at and then maybe it was just the times changing but maury was no longer at the helm and when he was there he was literally at the helm what uh, a thing that always stands out in my mind was one time i was hanging out up there and everybody knew who was in charge maury could could uh, go off on somebody in a in a heartbeat and it was never malicious uh, but it was kind of like a buddy rich kind of uh, impatience with people who yeah. weren't, weren't pulling their weight and so on. Sure. So when, when he yelled, people listened. Well, it was a really busy day in Frank's. I was hanging out. People were answering phones. People were shopping. People were playing symbols, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, Maury yells, Hey! Everybody looks around and freezes, and it got dead quiet. And I went, Oh, God, what, what did somebody do? What did, and I thought, Oh, huh. I picked the wrong day to come. Man. Everybody looks to see what he's yelling at, and he walks over where a kid was standing with a symbol on a symbol stand and a stick, and he grabs the stick out of his hand and says, you never hit it like that. And the kid had been coming straight down on this symbol. Yeah. And, and then he cooled off. And almost right away, the ambient noise picked back up. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> It's it was okay. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're safe. But Mary yeah. proceeded then to give him a little lesson on how to oh, get the geez. sound out of the symbol, draw it out, and and point out how this Man. kid was going to break a symbol if he continued with what he was doing. Yeah. But, but that was kind of gone under Marty. Um, and uh, Mary, when he was discussing the, the demise of Franks under Marty's, 
kind of blamed it on uh, the manufacturers, giving stuff away. He said, man, you can't make a buck anymore. All these endorsement deals that are going on and they're, they're giving away gear and so on. And But um, I think it, it no longer had a Frank Galt or Maury the Sean at the helm. But yeah. Marty, Marty then sold it and actually, who buys it but Bill Crowden. <laughs> so so uh, uh, Crowden's uh, he said at the time that it wasn't so much that he needed the inventory or anything, but he didn't want the name biting him. He'd had enough. He wanted to retire the name, basically. Sure. And I, he did get a lot of parts and uh, some uh, the old uh, rental drums and, and that kind of thing, but it had been kind of driven into the ground by the time Crowden acquired it. So then it was kind of Crowden's Drums Limited, is the name of Crowd Shop, Dash, Frank's Drum Shop. They moved off of Wabash and over to Jefferson. Uh, years are going by, 1989, Maury gets named to the Percussive Arts Society Hall of Fame. Uh, 1991, Crowden sells out and moves to Texas. And it was the same kind of deal there. Uh, Bill Crowden knew enough about drums, drumming, the drum world, and drummers to operate a, a successful shop. The people that he sold it to, it seemed like it was going to be uh, a successful thing. They knew the percussion world to an extent. Actually, they were heavy into the, the Celtic music, pipe, pipe band drumming and that kind of thing. Hmm. Uh, but Interesting. To, to Bill's shock and and kind of disappointment he told them he would work for practically minimum wage you know a certain number of hours and and make himself available as a resource to help them feel their way and get established and they never took him up on it he, oh, he wow. was never called once so Jeez. so he wasn't surprised at all when drums limited went out of business altogether in 1993 at that point the Frank's Drum Shop name became, uh, it was almost like a game of uh, pinball. But uh, who comes out with it in 1994 but uh, Guitar Center, of all things. And at that time, there were only, I think, there were 17 Guitar Center stores in the whole country. So it, was, it wasn't like today's Guitar Center. The guy that did the deal was a guy named Richie Padanik. And Richie Fadanik is a, a pretty famous name in, in the early days of Guitar Center. And he was a Chicago guy. He kind of brokered the deal for Frank's Drum Shop. And they did end up with a lot of parts and stuff. And by this time, the Chicago Drum Show had been going for three years. So Richie knew of the, of the drum show. And uh, he... I can't remember if the booth was in the name of Frank's Drum Shop or in Guitar Center, but he came to the show for a couple of years selling tons of old parts and everything that uh, were, were part of the, the whole Frank's Drum Shop uh, legacy. Just to clear it and out. I'm not even sure. Yeah, I'm not even sure now who owns it. A couple yeah. of the early signs from Frank's Drum Shop ended up at uh, Maxwell's shop in Chicago. Interesting. You see them over there. It's so far after the fact, though, that like a name like that, like this is really cool that we're doing this, but it it's so far past the original heyday that, you know, opening Frank's yeah. drum shop, yeah. your average 18 year old, you know, drummer isn't going to know the background to go. Oh, it's Frank's. Let me go yeah. in there. So it's sort of kind of, yeah. you know, went 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 as things do. It went away. Yeah. And uh Obviously, the value is going to depreciate. It's not going to be worth a fortune anymore for, for somebody to acquire the name. But sure. But um, Maury LaShawn passed in uh, 2000. Uh, the Chief passed in 2008. Bill Crowden passed in 2013. So a lot of those guys are, are gone now. But uh, it, it was a pretty good run. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's really just, it's, it's an iconic store, and I was looking back at uh, Andy Dwyer mentioned when he when we were first talking about doing this, he said that uh, they were one of the first 
uh, if not the first shop to have a clinic, like you mentioned, where a drummer would come in and, and present, you know, some ideas and stuff. So I think that's pretty neat um, to to mention. And I, I think it's cool that you yourself, obviously, are kind of a staple in the drum world and you've had retail shops and you've done thing all these different things. I mean, to me, hearing you tell the story, going into Frank's with your dad has to be a huge influence on the trajectory of your life, really. I mean, things turned out pretty drum yeah. heavy for you. I was really fortunate then and oh, uh, most of my career too. Yeah, my dad and also to Maury. Um, Maury called me when he wanted to do his memoir and I, I think it was probably because I had done that uh, history of uh, Frank's for the, uh, the modern drummer thing. And he knew that I, I had a foot in history and he knew I was starting to do the rebeats thing. But actually, Frank's for the Memories was my first book. And he called me in about March, I think it was, and said he wanted to do his memoir. He wanted me to be involved with it. And could I come down to see him? So I, I mean, 48 hours or so, I was in Florida with my camera and my tape recorder and everything. And i uh, always be grateful to him for involving me in it because it opened so many doors. We basically sat with the tape recorder and he and Jan told all the stories they could think of and showed me all their pictures. And then I went home and tried to organize it. And he said, I want this out uh, by November for Progressive Arts society convention Jeez. and i thought okay we've got six months i've never done a book uh <laughs> this is going to be interesting yeah. so we we got it out and uh and it was pretty primitive I, we, we didn't have the technology we have today and i had never done this kind of thing before so it's it's kind of riddled with uh typos and so on that hopefully will be clean enough uh in in the uh print on demand uh, version as yeah. i clean up the graphics and so on yeah. But we did get it out for the PAS uh, meeting. And one of the neatest things for me personally was Maury said that he wanted to have a section of uh, some of his best friends, drummers from the, uh, the back in the day. And he wanted mm -hmm. me to contact the, these people on the list and, and tell them what I was doing and get a photo from back in the day and one from the current day. Sure. and combine them and and the the list of people that he gave me was just insane and he gave me all the contact info the, the phone numbers that i needed and everything wow. like uh benny sywell ted reed gordon peters lloyd mccausland larry lincoln joel bates jake jerger uh, george gaber steve edelson vic for peter erskine barrett deems bunny carlos roy burns al blaine john Beck. Carmine of Peace. He put it's me in like touch everyone. With all these people. That's the dream. <laughs> and and, none of, and most of these people had never heard of me. I'd been in the industry for a little while then, but again, just to, from my music store in Michigan. But every single one of those people that I contacted uh, took my call when they heard that it had to do with Maury. And almost every one of them uh, had nothing but the best to say about him. Again, he. He could have a temper and he could go off on people, but everybody that I ever met that knew him very well really wanted to measure up in his mind because you knew if you were making Maury happy, you had kind of made it. You, yeah. you made it to sure. his standard. Sure. Uh, and so many of those people that I contacted, Carmine and, and Peter Erskine, and everybody all said, Maury's like a father to me. You know, I'll do anything for him. Yeah, and talk about opening doors. I mean, all of a sudden, I knew all these people. Yeah, and and they kind of liked me because of what I was doing. Yeah, and yeah, uh, if not for my dad dragging me up there and Maury getting me involved in this project, uh, you know, my life would have had a very different trajectory. <laughs> so, totally. I mean, uh, I feel I really grateful. I feel parallels to that of doing this and with talking with you very early on and getting you on and it's just like oh you're so friendly and, and helpful and have so much information and um i just think the 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 kicker of it is to just go out and ask people and, and talk to people and it really you'd be surprised how many people are eager to help yeah. um because you've given me a lot of guidance over the years yeah. 
some very, very important. Some are just like, you know, don't do that. And I immediately stop doing it. And it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's helped me a lot, but, um, so this is just awesome. I mean, you're kind of, you, as we're wrapping up here, why don't you tell people the best place to find the book? Obviously, you, like you said, print on demand, so mm -hmm. it's quicker and easier. Uh, where can they order it? Really, any bookstore now, uh, because the print on demand is through Ingram, and Ingram doesn't sell direct, but they'll, almost every bookstore of any size has an Ingram account. They're one of the giants in the book distribution sure. business. So really, any corner bookstore, I bet you could go in and order it. But Amazon has it, and uh, Ingram feeds Amazon, and in, in other countries. So if you're go to if you're in England, you go to Amazon UK, you should find it there, and and it's not going to be shipping from the United States and so on. It's yeah. of course at the Rebeat site, and I have it also listed on YouTube or on the eBay and Reverb. Great, um, yeah. But uh, makes no difference to me where you find it. But uh, yeah, be advised that it's it's going to be looking a lot better in the future as I, I scan these. I mean, this was done old school. The, the, the printer, it was a backyard printer, and he literally took uh, pictures of each black and white photo that I had and then screen printed them and so on. So uh, I'm really looking God. forward to making a lot of those pictures uh, stand out a lot better. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, this is just super cool. I'll put the descriptions. I'll find the easiest one to get to either rebeats.com, which is R-E-B-E-A-T-S.com or on Amazon. I'll put it in the description. All right, Rob, well, this is awesome. So um, everyone listening, Rob is kind enough to stick around and we're going to do a Patreon bonus episode. And we're going to talk about um, kind of before we recorded, Rob mentioned to me that like he really thinks and I agree with him that we are in kind of a, a an evolving golden era of drum shops because you kind of it's sort of a slow burn where you don't really notice what's happening right under your nose but there are drum shops everywhere i mean every big city has a drum shop that hasn't always been the case and no one knows that better than rob who has seen um shops come and go so um if you want to hear that go to drumhistorypodcast.com click the patreon link and you can join and hear those um from people like rob so Rob, thanks so much for taking the time to be here and uh, share all this great information and just be such a awesome returning guest on the show. And really, I see you as kind of a mentor um, in this whole drum history journey um, more than anyone else. I'm, I'm happy to uh, I'll say that you you and I have connected a lot. Um, and also, thank you to Andy Dwyer of ADC Drums in Liverpool, ADC.com co.uk is his website um so thanks to andy and uh of course thank you rob well thank you and thanks to andy uh he's definitely one of the good guys i've, I've been to his shop and actually stayed with him and his family a, a couple of times on visits to liverpool but you couldn't find a nicer guy in a, in a greater drum shop uh in england especially in uh, liverpool but thanks so much and uh, keep up the great work man.